for 10 years, Eppolito lives under a cloud of suspicion. When he eventually retires to a gated community in Las Vegas, he's still angry about his treatment at the hands of fellow cops. He decides it's time to share his story with the world and write a book about being a detective with mob connections. He gives the book the ironic title, Mafia Cop. The book is a hit and Eppolito gets invited on the talk show circuit. If Eppolito hoped to exercise his demons, one television appearance will bring them back to haunt him. In Staten Island, a woman called Betty Heidel sits down to watch daytime TV. When she sees Eppolito, it hits her like a sledgehammer. She recognized him immediately. 10 years earlier, Heidel's son, Jimmy, had disappeared. She vividly remembers that on the day he vanished, two men claiming to be cops came looking for Jimmy. She remembers so clearly because they roughed up her younger son. There was something about those two men that never sat right. Betty had always been convinced that they were involved in her son's disappearance. Now, 10 years later, Heidel believes she is looking at one of the men on the television. Heidel heads to the local store in search of Mafia Cop. She went out and purchased the book. And lo and behold, in the book was a photograph of Steve Caracappa, a very close associate of Detective Eppolito's. And she realized quickly that that was the second detective that she had seen outside the house that day. Convinced that Eppolito and Caracappa were the men looking for her son, Heidel goes to the police. She is interviewed by cold case specialist, Detective Tommy Dades, a decorated 20-year veteran of the NYPD. Dades listens closely to Heidel's story. Betty imparted some information to Tommy that she had never told uh, anyone in law enforcement before. And that was on the day that her son Jimmy disappeared. Lou Eppolito and Steve Caracappa were outside her house looking for her son Jimmy. Dades has to be cautious. Heidel is accusing two retired cops of involvement in a suspected homicide. But Dades is impressed with the clarity of Betty's memory and her conviction that Eppolito was involved. Something in his gut tells the detective that Heidel is telling the truth. His investigation will lead him to uncover the most shocking abuse of the badge in the history of the NYPD. Dades takes his concerns to the head of the Brooklyn Rackets Division, Assistant District Attorney Mike Vecchione. Vecchione listens carefully as Dades outlines the story he got from Betty Heidel. He came to me one morning, as he did many times before, and said, I think I got something on Eppolito. Are you interested? I said, yeah, tell me about it. What do you have? And he told me about Betty Heidel, that she called him and said, you know, there's something that I meant to tell you. And she related to him the incident involving Eppolito and Caracappa on the day that Jimmy Heidel disappears. So he said, I think that that's enough. He said, do you think it's enough to open up an investigation into you know, uh, Jimmy Heidel's death? And I said, yeah, I do. And that's how we started the investigation. Maybe something was missed in the initial investigation into Heidel's disappearance. So Dades orders the old NYPD and FBI case files. The initial hope was to solve the murder of Jimmy Heidel. But given Jimmy Heidel's connections to the Mafia, the investigation quickly broadens to include other cases that involve the mob. 
Tommy found out that there were boxes and boxes of material that were kept there as part of all of the investigations that were going on into the mob around that time frame, 10 years before. So we were able to get permission from the head of the organized crime section of the U.S. Attorney's Office to find the ones that he thought would be pertinent to an investigation into Caracappa and Epolito. And he did. He found, I think it might have been about 10 boxes worth of materials. Joe Ponzi was at the heart of Vecchione's investigation. Once we received all the reports and data, we created a war room in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. My curiosity was piqued. I had made up my mind that this was going to be examined and, and once again put to rest one way or the other. In the hunt for Epolito's name, they have to cast the net wide. The search takes them to a character at the heart of the FBI crackdown on the five big crime families back in the 1980s. The RICO Act had forced many top mafiosi to break the vow of silence and turn informer. One of them was a brutal underboss of the Luce's crime family, Anthony Gaspipe Casso. Facing the rest of his life in prison, Casso offered up everything to the feds. He decided to become a government witness. Casso held nothing back, and none of his former associates were safe. The way that the government debriefs people like him is they sit him in a room for days and they go through his entire history. So not only is he giving up himself, he's giving up everybody else who he has ever been involved with. Dades and Ponzi are intrigued to discover that among the many names that Casso gives up are the NYPD cops, Lou Epolito, and Stephen Caracappa. Given Epolito's court victory and his bleeding heart biography, the investigators are stunned to find Casso connecting him to the Lachey's underboss. I found that incredibly shocking. I struggled with the idea um, that this could be true. Casso first mentions the two cops in connection with the abduction of a man who was handed over to the Mafia. Central to the story was a close associate called Bert Kaplan. Kaplan told Casso that back in the 80s, he had a big problem. It was the height of the informant epidemic. And Kaplan believed he was going to be ratted on. So Kaplan wanted the rat to disappear. He was going to be the witness that put Kaplan away. Kaplan wanted him gone. He wanted to have that problem disappear from the equation, so to speak. And Kaplan had the means to make it happen. While he was inside Pennsylvania's Allenwood prison, he met an inmate with a story too good to be true. The inmate knew two crooked NYPD cops who could track down informants. At the time, Kaplan was cautious. At first blush, Bert wasn't interested. He was distrustful of cops. He felt that um, two cops that were willing to go to that level to betray their own oath and, and badges probably couldn't be trusted. 